Hi, everyone. This man is filming behind the scenes. Three, two, welcome. Welcome to Explorer. I'm Richard Bacon. We're going to take the Explorer, which has already won nearly 60 Emmys, and we're just going to take it somewhere else. Let's do this. Well, let's do it tonight. Tonight, we're going to talk about... The Arctic's biggest superstar. We really are having fun. Want to laugh, but we also want to have a conversation that's productive. Will rival any other entertainment show that's out there. Are you ready to rock? We're making documentary telling a studio event with an audience and people cheering and energy. We're bringing in guests. Please welcome Erin Brockovich. Panel discussions and performances. Eat some delicious gluten-free muffins. We should have some great debates tonight. So we're making 75 documentaries, three documentaries per episode, from ISIS to hallucinogenic honey. The remainder of the hour will bring the story that we've told back into studio, whether it's a panel discussion. Every American is so grateful for the police. An interview. Find the public prisons are just as bad. A rant. If you don't buy it, you're a racist. We like to give our conversations as much time as they need. The downfall of the environment and the lack of cleanup is deception. Interesting things. Not least of all, you're in great shape. <laughs> We're telling stories in a little bit of a different way without losing what's really special about this floor. Let's run the numbers. 33! 33 countries. We are confusing some humor and satire. 99 problems, but being a billionaire ain't one. We're not gonna give you the last word. The sex and the being high, I gotta say I prefer to the kidney failure. <laughs> but at the end of our show, you are gonna look at it differently. Entertainment and substance, not one or the other. This show will prove to be both. Good night! The all-new Explore with Richard Bacon. Mondays at 10 on the National Geographic Channel. How are you guys doing today? Hello! Hi. Welcome, welcome, Richard. I, How are you doing? Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. I love stuff like this. Yeah, it's going to be, I think, your show is sort of like, it's a conversation. We're talking about issues we're talking yep. about. We have an audience here. Yeah. Um, Hello, audience. There we go. Hi. Um, I want to start off. Look how enthusiastic they are. This is why I like <laughs> American TV They're all audiences. smiles. If you guys don't see, they're all smiles. You're all smiling back in Britain, all the audiences, because I'm, you know, I'm British, in case you hadn't noticed. But um, they, they're a bit surly. You know, they take things a bit seriously. <laughs> and here, everyone just kind of laughs and cheers, and is really enthusiastic. And um, that is why I've decided to become an American, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> there we go. We're glad to have you. Or at least until a couple of Tuesdays ago, and then I uh, reverted. There we go. There we go. That's exactly it. Um, I want to start off right with Explorer. Um, yeah. You know, this has been a long-running show on National Geographic for a while in a different format. Um, were, when you, before you came on as host of the new Explorer, I mean, were you very familiar with the old format? Yeah, very familiar. Yeah. yeah, as we explained in that trailer there, the Explorer is a show that's been on for nearly 30 years and has won 60 Emmys. <laughs> it's quite a... No small number, absolutely. I know. It's also, when you're taking on the brand, it's quite a lot to live up to. You're sort of getting... Nervous. What happens if we never win another? Um, but nearly 60 Emmys, um, and it's always been this one-hour documentary series, and it's al always told these stories from around the world, stories that should be told. It's always given you new angles on things. Um, and I think we decided that, A, we can tell more stories than one a week. So in our new format, we have three documentaries... And they're just kind of shorter. Um, and that around those documentaries, we can talk about the issues. So, you know, when you watch a good doc and then you talk about it, right? We, we've kind of brought the talking about it into the show. Mm. So you see the documentary and then in the studio, we'll go further with the conversation. And I think it's also about trying to turn documentary making into an event. So there's a studio audience, a very enthusiastic American studio audience <laughs> who are there, who, who are also very much part of the show as well. Yeah, I think you hit on a great point. I mean, you know, we have these documentaries. They go on their streaming services for... And then people talk for about a week about them. And it's not really a long-running conversation. It doesn't keep the, the conversation going. Um, now you guys are adding in a social media element. You know, you guys are having people talk about the stories as the stories are happening on air. Um, you know, tell me a little bit about how you are able to take people's perspectives. Are you looking for leads all over the world? How are you guys getting the leads for these stories? Uh, yeah, for we, three, three documentaries is a lot to make. It's a lot. So there's 25 episodes in the first series. Uh, so that means we're making 75 documentaries. 
and a very high proportion of our stories are abroad. Um, and tonight's show, so we're on tonight at 10 p.m. on the National Geographic tune Channel. Tune in, guys, tune in. Tune in, all of you. Um, uh, we want your enthusiasm as you watch the channel as well. But we're on tonight at 10, and our lead story is in Pakistan. And it's about a, a thing called the disposition matrix, which is a kill list. Uh, America has a kill list, a list of people that it wants dead. And this list is updated regularly by the president uh, himself. And when you're on that list, it's very hard to get off that list. And so we have, got, as you can imagine, you can't just call up and say, would you mind taking me off the list? Uh, and so we go, we get a hold of that list and we go to Pakistan and we talk to a man who's on the list. And, and what's really powerful about the interview that our correspondent Tim Samuels does is he interviews this man He's called Malik, I believe, and his son together. And his son, who's about 12, talks about how he lives with his dad and he lives in fear and he can hear the drones buzzing overhead looking to kill his dad. And you know that when drones take out, drones rarely take out one person at a time. They take out all the people around them. And so you get that human perspective. And also this man believes that he shouldn't be on the list as well. And so we tell that story. We have... To answer your question, uh, a team of producers in the office. It's, it's, it's kind of like a hybrid of a talk show and a newspaper investigations department. And so we're always looking for stories like the kill list to tell. And hopefully dangerous stories and bold stories. Sometimes we'll tell humorous stories. We had a story last week. Um, we went on an expedition last week to find the final ever batch of hallucinogenic honey. And we found it. It was a great segment. And you brought it for everybody. That's right? right. And I've brought some here for this very... That's why they're enthusiastic. I got them high before I came on stage. That's where it comes from. Um, and so it's that mix of stories. But we have a team of producers who have worked at CNN and MSNBC and a range of shows, talk shows and news programs and documentaries uh, who've come together to find these stories. One of our exec producers produced and shot herself most of Michael Moore's films. Mm. Um, and so we have a, we, our, our background is a mix of Michael Moore, Colbert, Letterman, 60 Minutes, MSNBC, CNN, and you put all that in a pot and you get um, hallucinogenic honey. <laughs> I have to imagine that those um, topics can get a little heated. I'm sure people have different opinions on when you're doing a drone a drone special, um, you know, yeah. people you're investigating, sort of people who are on this kill list, I'm sure they did something wrong to end up on this kill list. Perhaps they didn't. Um, not so, always. I mean, yeah. not always. So, sometimes it can be a case of mistaken identity. Yeah. I mean, that, and that's at the heart of this story. Are the people on the list the right people? Are they going after the right people? And we have a debate. So we play the, the film by Tim Samuels, our correspondent, who's gone to Pakistan, and he goes to Washington, um, I then interview Tim in the studio about his piece, which is also part of our show. And then uh, there's a panel, which includes the former head of the CIA, who's known as the father of the drone program, mm. James Woolsey, who's one of the people that really invented it. Um, and uh, I have a former drone operator on the panel as well, as well as an investigative journalist called Jeremy Scahill. And they talk together, and it is a, a heated debate. And the reason it's... You know, we'll always bring humor to the show, but we also want the show to be serious. Mm. And at the heart of the debate about drones is you put someone on a list. You know, we believe in the West, we believe in America and in Britain that if someone is accused of a crime, well, you arrest them and then the police gather evidence and that evidence is then handed over to prosecutors who weigh the evidence, who decide if they're going to take you to court and then the court is an open process that the public can go to if they want to. It's very open and the, the evidence is presented, and then a jury decides if you're guilty, and then the judge decides if you go to prison or not. With the kill list, there's none of that. There's no transparency at all. So we're giving someone the death sentence without really weighing up, certainly weighing up publicly, the evidence uh, against them. And so it's, it's a fascinating debate. The, the counter-argument, I mean, there's, there's so many arguments with the, with the drone program, Another argument against it is that it famously kills a lot of innocent people. Uh, and some of, the drone, some of the drone strikes have taken out 80% innocent people. Um, but the counter-argument, as President Obama has made, as you see him make in the film tonight on the show, 
is that in conventional warfare, when you send in ground troops, far more civilians get killed. So civilians do get killed with drones, but fewer civilians get killed than if you were to send troops in. So this is, there's a lot to this argument, um, but I hope that illustrates what we're trying to do with the show. Show you the story, give you a new angle, and then talk about it and debate it. And, and you know, that sounds um, like a lot to take on as far as a host to try to keep it entertaining and light. And also I mean, try and you... find humor along the exactly. way as well. I mean, you know, Colbert and these guys have entered the field who are able to do stuff like to take the serious sub, you know, subjects and, and sort of bring it to, to levity. I mean, is that a difficult task for you? Is that something that you've always been able to do? I, mean, it, uh, I hope so. My, my background is um, I spent eight years hosting a news program for the BBC on the radio, and it was news and it was, it was interviews. Um, but as well as that, I've also hosted things like game shows. And so I have this really unusual mix. In, in America, you tend to be a news person or a game show person. Um, and, and back home, you can sort of be both. And other people will have to you know, assess whether being one undermines the other. But I kind of have a mix of, of both backgrounds. So I do try and bring humor to these, uh, to these things. It is, look, we're, we're still really evolving the show. And we are still learning. And we're, we're making of little changes every week as we put the show out and we get audience feedback and change it again. So we've just launched uh, in America. We then launched in 170 other countries in early 2017 and the show will be broadcast in 171 languages. So not only do we go to places like Pakistan to tell you the story about the drone program, our show will get shown in Pakistan. And so we really hope as we tweak and learn and build that this story can change things. The, the, it starts that we want to debate in the studio, but we want other people to debate on social media and beyond. But we really hope that the show has a reach that uh, gives it the ability to change things. But in answer to your original question, I do want to bring humor to the show, and I'm still learning about that balance and, and where it works. We're only, we've only put two shows out so far. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, tell me a little bit about... Um, stories that obviously the drone and the hallucinogenic honey, I mean, those are things that are di very different. Um, what stories have you brought to the table? I mean, were there any stories that you were ultimately fascinated by? Or I'm sure there's things that you brought up in the I mean, I'm fascinated yeah. by almost everything. I'm just a very, very enthusiastic person in life. And I, I, uh, there's very little I'm not interested good in. Good quality to have. It is a good a Sport is one of the few things I'm not really interested in, um, which I realize everybody else is. Um, but I'm not. But every, anything else I'm fascinated by, I occasionally go into the field myself. We have a team of correspondents who've worked on The Daily Show and who've worked across newspapers and in news channels and all sorts of documentary strands uh, and won lots of awards. But I occasionally go into the field. I went to Italy, to southern Italy, to spend some time, some time uh, living with some refugees Again, we want to bring you new angles on stories. And so the idea of this story, which I think is in next week's show or the week after, but it's, um, it's about a town that welcomes refugees. And in America recently, particularly during Trump's campaign, there was a lot of anti-refugee rhetoric and there was a lot of, you know, let's not let any refugees from Syria in. You never know, one of them might be a terrorist. And the point of this story, because it's an issue I really care about, um, I'm effectively an immigrant to America myself, and, and I, with refugees, they are people often fleeing the same enemies as us, and they are, their lives are hard enough without us in the West making them harder. And so I wanted to tell this story, in w a story about a town that welcomes refugees, houses them, and finds them jobs. And I wanted to see what the native Italians in that town thought to that. And it turns out that the truth is, when people live side by side with refugees, when they get to know refugees, they don't really have a problem with refugees. And that, so that's one story that I've told. Yeah, and I mean, you're in this amazing position that you get to go to these locations. I mean, when you bring out something up in the, you know, in the pitch, um, you know, maybe it could look great on paper or you could have a certain idea on paper and then you get there and the story evolves and the story changes. I mean, is that what happened in Italy as well? Did you go there with a certain yeah. idea of what you want to capture and then find a story that maybe was so provoking it helped tell the story? Definitely. That, that always happens in the field because you meet people who, again, may give you an angle you hadn't considered yourself and so you adjust the story. Or the, someone will say, well, you need to go and speak to this guy over here. So 
It affects you as you go. Occasionally, we, we've shot stories that haven't made it to air. You know, we have these pitch meetings, and, um, and occasionally they may, the story might not turn out to be what you thought it was going to be. And that's why I say it's partly a newspaper investigations unit as well. It's, you know, we, try, we just want to tell these stories, and stories that we really hope engage you, and stories that we hope you think about, and stories that maybe, as I said earlier, can change things. And, but at the heart of it all we want this show to be entertaining. And so we're trying to pull off this trick of being an entertainment show with really what we think of as being important stories at the heart of it. It, it must be really a lot of pressure to try to tell the story of Syrian refugees in 15 minutes or 20 minutes or 10 minutes. Uh, I mean, are you, as far as the editing process, are you guys sort of working to perfect, you know, yeah. you know we're in, in an age where clips and, and little vignettes live on the web and those things can be shared. I'm sure yeah. your show that will be happening. That's part of our show. Uh, National Geographic uh, is this, I think of it as being this counterintuitive brand in, in that it's, Nat Geo is a 128-year-old magazine, right? It's, it's old, it's what we call old media, and it will give uh, a photographer a decent-sized budget to spend six weeks photographing one B, right? And at the other end of the spectrum, National Geographic is the most followed company on social media in the world. On Instagram alone, it has, I think, 65 million followers, second, second only to the Kardashians, <laughs> which slightly undermines the point I'm making. Um, but uh, collectively, it's something like 250 million followers on social media. So, and this is the advantage of telling these documentaries in shorter form. Explorer, as I said earlier, used to be one hour at a time. Now we tell these stories in 10 minutes or seven minutes or four minutes. And we, what we want to do as we build and grow and work out the show is we want to share these stories. So we'll take short form bits of these stories from, for example, Pakistan and our story about the drone program. And we'll put that on social media, uh, which is another way for it to reach an audience. So as we grow and get more confident, our stories will reach people through social and we'll go out in 171 countries around the world. Um, and that's, yes, that's basically our strategy. Yeah, and you know we're talking a little bit well, about more people have turned up. There we go, exactly. You're, you're an eloquent speaker, and Aye. they're showing up for you. Um, you'll have those vignettes that live on the web, and then also you're looking to bring people, obviously, in the studio for yeah. your conversations. Yes. I mean, you've had Michael Moore already. We've had Michael Moore. Yeah, and Michael Moore, and then I'm sure there's other people that you'd aim to get in the room. What kind of people are you looking to bring in? Is there a criteria? Is there? I think uh, well, a guest. So the criteria is partly we, I'm going to interview the correspondents who've told these stories. Uh, but also, it's people connected to the stories, such as the former head of the CIA who comes on to talk about drones. Uh, it is also... Um, we, we will have really well-known people on the show as well, but they have to be either connected to a story or have an issue they really care about. So the aforementioned Kardashians are unlikely, you know, as much as they bring us a following, are unlikely to make it on. But we will have people talking about... Uh, so musicians, film stars, TV stars, if they care about the drone program, if they care about climate change, climate change will always be a big thing for us, then we absolutely will um, will have them on and talk to them. Is there a climate change story that people can look out for, or one that you're working on We've right now? We've got a few. I, my first job, I got this job with National Geographic um, uh, earlier this year. It's an amazing operation. The first job I did for Nat Geo was to interview President Obama about climate change. It's your first gig. That was my first Not thing bad. they asked me to do. They called me, well, like, I just got the job and I was in a hotel and it was early one morning and I'd been out, had a couple of drinks, I was a bit hungover and my phone went and it was the director of communications for Nat Geo and he said, oh, just so you know, you're being vetted by the Secret Service. I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> and he said, yeah, you're, um, he said, you're interviewing President Obama on Saturday. And so President Obama and I went for a walk in Yosemite together. Um, through the redwood trees of, of Yosemite. And that was my first job for this channel. And it was really sweet. It was just me and him. Mm. He, he drove himself there. Um, and he, he, he was running a bit late because he couldn't find anywhere to park. And so I know my mistake, he came in a military helicopter, <laughs> followed by another military helicopter. Um, but when you see the pictures of our interview, it's, it's, it looks like it's just me and him. But behind the cameras are like, 30 people with machine guns tracking backwards and a motorcade just out of shot of 20 vehicles 
one of which is an ambulance containing his blood, and another one, another one is a car with the nuclear launch codes in it. But that's what they say about hiking. You know, come prepared. <laughs> come prepared. Come prepared to start a nuclear war. So, um, so that, there's an example mm. of a climate change story for you. Mm. I mean... Um Going from that, I mean, what was, you know, the next, you know, when you're going to the pitch meetings, I mean, what are the things that you're bringing up? What are the things you guys are talking about? When you get in that first with the executives from, you know, Colbert Report and the people yeah. that you yeah. guys have all brought together for the show. So the, the way the, the, the pitch meeting, and I, I started out working in news, uh, and it, it reminds me of working in newsrooms where we have three execs on our show who sit on chairs a bit like this, uh, one side of the room. And then everyone, the, the producers, the assistant producers, the writers, anyone working there, the guy who works on the front door, anyone can just suggest stories. And so uh, th that's how we generate them. It's a room a bit like this, with this number of people here, as you see in the audience, and everyone just lobs in um, ideas for stories. Uh, but we, I'm really proud of, of the stories we're telling. There's, there's another story in tonight's show to give you an example of, of what we're doing here. And by the way, there is levity, there are funny stories. But as well as the drone program tonight, and as well as the interview with the former head of the CIA, uh, we tell a story uh, about um, some Syrians, some Syrian expats who are being chased down by ISIS. They've moved to Istanbul in Turkey next door. And they make a satirical newspaper, which they then deliver back into Syria at great personal risk and distribute. And it's a satirical newspaper. And they also make satirical videos on YouTube. And so they are trying to undermine ISIS, not with bombs and bullets, but with words. Uh, because the people in the world who take themselves the most seriously are the people most vulnerable and susceptible to, to humor. You know, people like Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> but there are people who can't deal with jokes very well. And... Uh, and so they are trying to undermine ISIS with jokes. And so we tell this story. We, it was too dangerous for us to send our own correspondent there, so they almost had to film it themselves. They largely did film it themselves, and they got the footage back to us. But it's the world's most dangerous newspaper delivery, and they are driving newspapers into Syria full of jokes about ISIS to annoy ISIS and undermine ISIS. And so that's in tonight's show as well. Uh, well, that sounds pretty incredible. People should tune in for that. Um, there's a couple of questions out there in the audience. Hi. Hello, audience. Hello, enthusiastic audience. Oh. Hi. Hi. Oh, hello. Hi. 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 Um, I was wondering, what do you do if you experience any emotional fallout from covering these stories? Emotional in what sense? Um, emotional fallout from? From Syrian refugee story or the drone story? The, do, in the sense Personally, that, I think personally. the impact. For me? Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, um... I mean, I do get em emotionally affected by quite a lot of stories, and in particular, the refugee story. When you're talking to... I mean, there's a, a lady called Blessings from Nigeria who, in the piece, tells me how she, along with her four children, made it to Italy on an inflatable boat, like an inflatable raft across the Mediterranean, and somewhere along the way, someone tries to drown her and her children... Um, and she tells the story of how she makes a connection with the only other woman. There's a boat trying to drown them. She doesn't know who it was, but she spotted a woman on the boat, and how she just pleaded with her as a mother to stop. And, and this is a moment at which this woman's kids are going to drown. She's now made it to Kamini in southern Italy, where she's a dressmaker, and she's happy. And it's very hard not to be emotionally affected by somebody telling you that story. Emotionally affected in that it's dangerous and heartbreaking what she went through and also emotionally affected in the sense that there is this very happy story that she's in Kamini, but again, upsetting that that's, she's in very much a minority, that that is not the story of most refugees fleeing Boko Haram as she was and they killed her father. So I do get emotionally caught up in it, but I think that's okay on television. I, I don't think that's, that's a bad thing. It's not you don't want to put too much of your own emotions into this kind of storytelling because you want to communicate the story. But where you get affected and people see you affected, where you get passionate and people can see that you are passionate, I think it only enhances the storytelling. And I think it only enhances the connection that the audience have with what you're doing. Thanks. Thanks. Right. I like that question very much. Next question. Hi. Right there. Hi. What's your name? My name. 
Hello. Hi. My name is Delia. Nice to meet you. Delia? Yes. Oh, you Delia. said it perfectly. Hey. Nice. Okay, so um, my question is, what is the process of elimination between the stories and which is more interesting than the other for the show? Yeah, that, well, it's a, it's a great question, that. Um, and it's not something that you're always going to get right. I think for us, the way we look at the stories is, it's one, is there a new angle on it? Uh, it's two, we want to tell quite big global stories. We, we have an audience in America and we have a global audience. So it's, it's, can this play around the world? Is it a big story? Sometimes you can illustrate a big issue through something smaller, but I think we want our stories to be relevant and real um, and dramatic uh, and to have consequence. We want them to spark debate and conversation. So we kind of think about all those things. We think about, has this story already been told a lot? If it's a story that we're about to tell in a way that you've already seen told on CNN or read about a lot in the New York Times or wherever, then we're less likely to do it. It's, about, it's partly about, are we, is there a way in which we're telling this in a new fashion? That's the question we ask. Um, and it, it, they're difficult decisions to make. Um, but it is. But that's basically it. Is it new and is it big? I suppose is is how we how we do it. Thank you. But uh, please watch. <laughs> you sound engaged by it already. <laughs> hey. Um, okay. Last question right there. Yes. Hello. Hey, What's Richard. your name? Philip. Hi. Hi. Thank you for being here. Uh, do Hi. you experience jet lag? And if so, how do you overcome? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, do I experience jet lag, and how do I overcome it? Uh, I do experience jet lag. I fly so much. In the last week, I've done the LA New York trip four times, just in the last seven days. I went to LA for Thanksgiving and then I came back here to do some reshoots and went back again. And now I'm back here in, in New York where I live. Um, so sometimes if you fly just an insane amount, at no point does your body actually work out where it is, <laughs> what's going on or what time it is. So that's one way. Or occasionally, I do this a bit less now, but I used to get very drunk on the night before a big flight so that when you got on the flight, irrespective of the time you got on the flight, you would be knackered and you would go straight to sleep. <laughs> um, so they're the two options. Either get drunk or just fly constantly so that your body never knows where it is in the world. <laughs> That's some great advice right there. Yeah, yeah. So guys, tune into National Geographic's Explorer tonight on Monday, and then look for that global launch in uh, January, next coming up yeah, in January, so, right, yeah, Richard? Somewhere early 2017 is when we're launching globally. But tonight, as I say, it's the kill list tonight. It's the story about Syria tonight. There'll be humor in there. But I think it's, I'm really proud of tonight's show. So yeah, it's 10 p.m. on the National Geographic channel, which actually we've rebranded as just National Geographic. We decided that our viewers are too busy to say National Geographic Channel, so we save them a bit of time. <laughs> We're just National Geographic, 10 p.m. tonight. There you guys go. One more hand for Richard, please. Thank you. Thank you.